Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our uh, usual Wednesday slot. Um, today, we are, it's a combination of the uh, FRCS Mentor Group and OR UK. Um, we are very proud to bring you uh, Mr. Shah Panwar. He's a consultant knee surgeon in, um, uh, based in University of Hospital Lucian in South London. His main areas of expertise are knee and hip replacement surgery, as well as soft tissue sports injuries and soft tissue knee injuries. His particular interest is in partial knee replacement, day case arthroplasty and ACL reconstruction. He's a member of the British Association of Knee Surgery and is committed to medical education. Uh, uh, he, in 2013, he undertook a fellowship uh, year in complex arthroplasty and sports injury training in Perth, Western Australia. And before returning to the UK, he had been appointed to, as a consultant in orthopedic uh, surgery uh, in Lucian. He, we are very pleased with his talk today, which is going to be quite important for the FRCS exam, um, controversies in ACL reconstruction. Um, before we... Uh, before I introduce Mr. Ponwar, I just want to uh, remind everyone that uh, if you have any questions, please do type in the uh, chat uh, and we will ask the questions at the end. Um, also, people who wish to participate in the Viva, please do uh, let uh, Hani Albarasi know. Uh, you can send him a message or raise your hand in the, in the chat group. Um, and without further ado, Mr. Ponwar, it's a real pleasure to hear your talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Swan. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you to Oric UK and the FSS Mentor Group. Um, it's a topic close to my heart, um, but um, hopefully I didn't bite off too much. So let's get on with it. Controversies in uh, ACL reconstruction. I don't have any disclosures. I currently use um, Smith & Nephew products. Um, we will have one of the longest history in ACL reconstruction work. And there's images here from various sources, no patient identifiable images. Right, what's my objectives today? What are the main controversies? Graph choices, tunnel placement, uh, mainly on the femoral side, to be honest, fixation choices, the additional procedures you might want to do, and just some small print stuff, timing of surgery and rehabilitation. So bone patella tendon bone, um, traditionally, this was the go-to graft, easy to harness, front of the knee. Um, is it still the gold standard? Hamstrings certainly were popular during my training and um, low donor site morbidity. Um, and I would say 90% of the ACR reconstructions you'll see will be hamstrings. Um, quads tendon plus or minus patella bone block is fairly new and the Americans seem to be very keen on it. Um, there are minimal grafting, you know, donor harvesting techniques, but time I think will tell whether this is a superior graft. Other smaller options are allograft, so donated cadaveric um, tendon uh, tends to be irradiated and slightly weaker than your own uh, tendons or synthetic um, graft, which was very popular in Australia uh, in the 90s, um, such as Lars. And there's certainly been a move away from that. So, you know, what are we looking for? We're looking for a strong graft. Now your native ACL has a low to failure strength around 2000 Newtons. Um, a 10 millimeter bone patella tendon bone graft has more than that, about 3000 Newtons you're gonna get direct bone to bone healing. So that's very strong. Um, four strand hamstring graft, about 3000 to 4000, depending on what you read. And that's slightly more than the actual bone patella tendon um, graft itself. Quads tendon, similar, and allografts range from 2000 to 4000. But as you can see, we're all in the read, reason of over 2000. These are very strong. That's not really going to be your initial weakness. Sorry, move on. Your initial weakness is probably going to be your fixation, um, particularly when the graft is, you know, bedding in. So BPTB, bone patella tendon bone, popular for heavy males, 
but there is an increased risk of anterior knee pain, uh, patella fracture, patella tendon contracture, but you get this solid bone to bone healing. Your hamstrings need to be at least 7.5 to 8 millimeters. Now, if you've got a short, particularly short female, um, you know, you have to you know, just be concerned that you might have quite short tendons. There is a risk of saphenous nerve injury um, and you can lose the end kick of sprinting, but largely there's very little uh, donor morbidity from taking hamstrings. Allografts, um, so donated tendon, sort of thing Michael Owen had back in the day, um, really for professional straight line athletes only. So sprinters or rowers, um, there's a high re-rupture rate, but it might be just right to get those people through their careers. Um, in some studies, a four times higher re-rupture rate. I haven't really talked about return to sport at the level that people were at, but it's something you should consent people for because I think it is quite difficult for professional athletes to get back to the same level of um, sport that they were at. The synthetic grafts will eventually fail. They can cause synovitis and bone cysts. It was very popular in Australia following an Aussie football's football rules player who had a Lars graph and got back to playing very quickly. But since then, there've been lots of failures and there's now a position statement from Australia saying don't use them. So what's the reality? What graph are you gonna choose? It's, it's like anything, it's based on your training, your fellowship, and perhaps current trends will influence you. Lots of training opportunities now as a consultant to um, go to soft tissue labs and even abroad. When, when we're allowed to travel and um, you know keep, your, keep an eye on what's happening. But I do think your training and your fellowship really does affect what you use. You want low donor site morbidity. ACLs tend to be day case surgery, so you want to be able to manage pain. And hamstring tendons are very versatile. Um, the quadriceps tendon is relatively new, something I think I'm looking into, and I'm sure those of you, you know, younger knee surgeons coming through will be looking into. And as I said before, your technique and initial fixation is more important than your graft choice. The weak point is tibial fixation. It's a question you might get asked in the FRCS. There's greater shear forces. And again, remember the metaphysical bone on the tibia can be weaker, particularly if these patients are deconditioned. Um, uh, graft preparation. There is some controversy about tensioning, but it makes sense. Um, it's a ligament, um, it removes creep. Uh, if you pull on your graft, you don't, you can't pull on a patella tendon graft, but for hamstrings, useful detention. The vancomycin swab is not really controversial anymore in the, the papers about using that on your graft. Um, it does reduce infection. It's, I use it, it's really easy to do. One gram vancomycin and saline and just um, soak a swab prepare your graft and a graft master and wrap it in there. Your hamstrings, there's lots of different configurations. I've just put a diagram of some of the things you can do if you wanna make your graft stronger. The classic is the one over on the right side there, just a quadrupled semi-T and gracilis graft um, over usually suspension fixation. There's an interference screw in the tibia. Um, you can triple your semitendinosis put the gracilis over the top to make a five strand graft. You can, if you have 30 centimeters long of both tendons, stitch them both together and triple them to make a six strand graft. Um, hamstrings should be over 7.5 millimeter diameter, really eight millimeters. Uh, and you want, I'm looking for 10 centimeters long, really, for a standard um, suspensive fixation on the femur and a tibial interference screw. So um, that's gonna be about four centimeters in the femur, about one and a half, two centimeters within the joint and about four, 4.5 uh, centimeters on the tibia. And you can adjust your tunnel drilling if you have a slightly shorter graft. You need a shorter graft if you're using suspensory fixation on both sides. It's becoming more popular, um, such as the Arthrex graft link, um, but doesn't come without its own possible complications. So femoral tunnel placement, probably the most highly debated thing in ACL reconstruction. You need to know your terminology. It might make something that might come up in the exam. 
instead of proximal, distal, anterior, posterior, we tend to use high, low, deep, and shallow. Deep being posterior, shallow being anterior. Remember the knee will be flexed usually at 90 degrees when you're doing your femoral tunnel. And then high for proximal and low for distal. Now the initial uh, ACL reconstructions were open. Um, not gonna talk about those. Um, they violated the fat pad and um, you know, much more painful procedures. Um, I think I saw one very, my first registrar drop back in 2007. The transtibial technique is also not used that often these days, though still in you know, quite, um, quite widespread use, um, where you would bend the knee to 90, drill through the tibia, use an over the top guide to put through the tibia, hook over the back of the femoral notch, and then you can drill your um, femoral tunnel. Now clearly you'll be constrained by where you've put your tibial tunnel. So you tend to get quite a high um, you know, graft really, high and vertical. And that, that doesn't really give you very good rotatory control. Might give you some AP control, but didn't give you very good rotatory control. So if you look at the diagram on the right, um, antromedial drilling, which I'm sure most of you have seen, gives you a greater obliquity, but you do need to hyperflex the knee. Otherwise you can get shorter tunnels. Um, and um, there's also the risk of iatrogenic damage to the medial femoral condyle, particularly if you're drilling a, a large graft. But the greater obliquity uh, leads to greater rotatory control. So what's the evolution of femoral tunnel placement? Now, most of you will have heard of the clock face um, method. Um, say for a right knee, you could use 11 p.m., quite the old-fashioned high position, and you could use 1 p.m. for left knee. Now, the disadvantage of the clock face is that uh, that's a 2D um, description, and obviously it's 3D, the notch, so it doesn't give you any um, idea about depth, but it's still useful um, as a, a aim. And I think with femoral tunnel placement, you want to use lots of different things. Um, the ridges are quite commonly used now. There's the lateral intercondylar ridge, so-called residence ridge, um, because you don't want to go above it. Uh, and with the bifurcate ridge, which is meant to separate the two bundles. I haven't discussed um, ACL anatomy. Um, I'm sure most of you are aware of ample, antromedial bundle and posterolateral bundle. Uh, and we'll actually perhaps uh, challenge that um, classic um, description of ACL anatomy in a bit. So from the clock face, um, we went down to anatomic um, reconstruction. Now, if you're doing anatomic reconstruction, you can either do a double bundle, true, true anatomic, so try and do an antromedial bundle at the back, postulapse at the front, or you can do a single bundle anatomic at the midpoint of the femoral footprint, and I'll show some diagrams later, or you can perhaps go to more higher and deeper position at the back of the knee in the center of the antimedial bundle. Now, we've gone from the higher initial graphs, quite vertical, going more and more anatomic, and I think there is now a trend to go back to a slightly higher and deeper position. So instead of 11 p.m., sort of 10.30 on the right, about 1.30 on the left. And we'll explain why that might make biome biomechanical and anatomical sense. The ridge technique, uh, the image on the right is um, from one of my cases. Um, you can see you've got an empty lateral wall. So you've got a PCL on the side here. We don't tend to do notch blasties so much in um, the UK. Um, I think if you do have a very narrow uh, V-shaped notch, maybe in a lady and you're gonna get impingement um, against um, either the side of the notch or the PCL, you might want to consider some form of notch plasty. Um, but you can often see these ridges and you can see the remnants of the femoral insertion. So I always look and look for a lateral intercondylar ridge um, and then you can look for the bifurcate ridge. Often the remnants will help you um, decide where these are. If you're going to do anatomic placement, you want to go in the midpoint of the femoral footprint, which is quite low, I think. So there are different ways of doing it. You can measure with an arthroscopic ruler. 
um, and often you have to change portals for that because you need to measure on the lateral side and then you can go in the midpoint of your measurement so you can measure um, and go in the midpoint um, you can also use the bundles if you can see the bifurcate ridge you could just make a mark there and this is a, a double bundle technique um, but for single bundle center of the footprint Double bundle was popularized by Freddie Fu in America, um, but I think it really has fallen out of favor. If you've got inadequate graph size, you're gonna get graft impingement, tunnel placement problems, and that revision, you're dealing with four tunnels. So I think anatomic reconstruction is still a, definitely a thing, but I think people will tend to go more for a center footprint on the um, bifurcate ridge with a single bundle rather than go for a double bundle technique. There are other ways of um, working out where your femoral tunnel is that um, I don't use. There are grids. There's a Bernhard and Hertel grid. Um, you can use interoperative fluoroscopy. I think you can always use navigation. And these are ways that you can look at your tunnel placement following surgery, um, perhaps on a CT scan. Uh, I don't use fluoroscopy, but you can um, take true lateral x-rays, we use it for other knee surgery, such as MPFL reconstruction, and you can um, you know, use standard percentages that I'll show you later um, to work out exactly where you want to go. So the anatomy of the knee has been revisited several times. Um, this classical teaching of anteromedial and postlateral bundles has been challenged. There's a recent concept of the ACL being more flat and ribbon-like, tends to be coming from this paper by Smigileski uh, from Poland, but working with a very well-known um, London knee surgeon, Andrew Williams. Um, the recent concept is that it's more flat and ribbon-like, and there are two different types of fiber attachment. Direct fibers, which appear to be carrying more load, both histologically and I think macroscopically, and they're attached high and deep within the region of the anteromedial bundle, and then indirect fibers, which have a weaker attachment and take less of a load. This is the paper. Um, it's freely available uh, on the um, internet, and um, I'd recommend you have a look at it. So this is also in the paper. This is the uh, posterior femoral cortex. This is the back of the notch. This red line is the direct fibers, which seem to have a very a double tide mark has been described, seems to have a very um, strong attachment to the back of the knee. And look how far back it is. You really want to go as far back as you dare. And this yellow one is indirect fibers um, in the region of the postulateral bundle, the so-called postulateral bundle, not quite as distinct. So they propose that we should put our ACLs in the region of the direct fiber insertion. Now, this agrees with another concept from Stephen Howe, Pearl, and McAllister um, called the ideal femoral location. Uh, and this is actually on the Zimmer Biomet website, though um, it's come from lots of different research, but it's a lovely, um, lovely bit on the website and it even gets you to choose where you'd put um, your own tunnel. So, ideal stands for isometric. We want the length tension relationship similar to native ACL. ACL. We want it really to stay the same length throughout a range of motion as best as possible. The D stands for direct fibers, as we discussed before. Uh, eccentric means it doesn't have to be in the center of the footprint. And um, they're saying go higher in the footprint and in the anteromedial portion, which agrees with that Smigileski paper. And they're completely separate concepts um, from different parts of the world. Equidistant, so halfway to the top and bottom of the notch, which is a good interoperative check. and in real life, you're going to be using um, your experience in interoperative checks. So I clear the notch uh, at the back and I do look for the top and the bottom of the notch. I look for the articular cartilage and it does tend to be in the middle. Because uh, remember, if you're drilling, say, an eight millimeter graft uh, tunnel, by the time you've marked your tunnel, um, it's going to be four millimeters bigger forward and four millimeters bigger backwards. So you have to take that into account. Um, the A stands for anatomic, um, and the L stands for low tension. Um, the anatomic, uh, I think, you know, stands for 
um, you know, in the intermediate bundle, they're not going for a central footprint position. And there's a diagram which is on that website and the green part there sort of shows the confluence of where they think all these things um, coincide. So it's where all these circles overlap in this sort of position, which I hope you'll agree is high and deep in the region of the direct fiber insertion. So where do I put it? I put it in the center of the intermedial tunnel. So behind the bifurcate ridge, just slightly, um, knowing that by the time I've drilled, it'll be, say I'm drilling an eight millimeter tunnel, most commonly, it'll be four millimeters behind and four minutes in front, but always behind the bifurcate ridge and just um, under the lateral intercondylar ridge. Now, Clatworthy AL also with um, Andy Williams and the Danish registry has shown a higher failure rate uh, of 3.5 times in the Clatworthy study using an anatomic tunnel placement. That's more of a low, more shallow placement. So, you know, I would go for the antromedial bundle and I would leave at least two millimeters posterior wall. Because if you're going to the back, there is a risk of blowout. That's not all, always a bad thing if you're using suspensory fixation, but you need to know that you've done it. So I'll show you, show you an oscopic picture later and you, I always check the posterior walls intact. So femoral tunnel drilling technique is also controversial. We talked about transtibial. I don't think many of you will be doing that anymore. You tend to view from, or I tend to view mainly from the lateral portal. I'm ready to view from an intermedial portal if I can't get around the corner and I can't get um, a good view. Um, and if you are viewing from an intermedial portal, you drill from an accessory intermedial portal. Most tunnels are drilled inside out, but outside in came in mainly through Arthrex. There's the flip cutter, which um, you make a hole laterally on the femur. You put in the flip cutter device, and then you can um, uh, drill from the lateral femoral cortex inwards, open the little um, flip cutter, and then drill your socket backwards um, that way. So you're gonna get a socket rather than a tunnel. If you do that on both sides, you can sometimes have graft socket mismatch as you can have patella tendon um, socket mismatch. And so sometimes people just drill uh, an outside in tunnel on the femur and a, and a whole transtibial tunnel um, from outside in as normal because um, you don't want to have more problems, but it is an attractive technique, the graft link arthrex technique. Flexible versus rigid reamers. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for rigid, uh, sorry, flexible reamers. You can probably get less than an oblique tunnel and you can get around the um, uh, medial femoral condyle, but it's, um, there are many in use. Striker have them. Um, and certainly I haven't used any as of yet. Just beware your short tunnels antromedial drilling. There's three stages to a straightforward endo button drill. First, it's a, a 2.5 millimeter beef pin. Um, if, if you can measure off that and if it doesn't feel right, you can readjust. By the time you drill the 4.5 millimeter endo button drill, you get a good measurement. Um, it can be difficult to change because you can get tunnel convergence. You can still change at that stage. But once you drill the big acorn reamer, then it is quite difficult to change. So need to hyperflex. Be careful where your hand is. I tend to go about 30 degrees from the midline uh, out to the side when I'm drilling through the intermedial portal. And um, I dip my hand slightly. And once you do quite a few, you know where your pin should come out and you, you're looking for a tunnel about 40 to 45 millimeters. It's quite consistent if you've got it right. So these are the different views you can get. Um, this one in the middle is viewing from a standard lateral portal. You can get a slightly better view than that. But if you say you got a view like this and you weren't quite happy that you could see properly the back of the notch, you could change to a high intermediate portal and then you could drill through an accessory intermediate portal and you get more face on. I tend to put my accessory intermediate portal a little bit more in to avoid the medial femoral condyle. And depending where you put your hand, we, you can change the oblique of the tunnel. Some people like very short tunnels. Obviously, if you've got a short graft or you're using a quadruple semi-T, you might want to purposely drill short tunnels. The tip of the tunnel is less controversial, really. Um, I tend to use anatomical landmarks, the posterior border of the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. So that's the anterior horn lateral meniscus. 
lots of you all have done knee replacements. You can see that the the um, ACL starts very anteriorly. You want to go in the middle, really. If you go too anterior, it'll be tight in flexion. So I find the posterior border of the anterior horn tends to be slightly red. It's obviously seen. And then you triangulate with the PCL at the back um, and the medial tibial spine. There's also intercondylar eminence um, in front of the PCL. And you use a 55 degree tip or elbow, elbow aimer. I tend to prefer a tip aimer so that I know exactly where the wire is going to come out. If you increase your angle, you get a slightly longer tunnel. And conversely, if you decrease your angle, you get a shorter tunnel, which might be useful. Um, again, that paper, um, which talked about the ribbon attachment, there's some nice um, anatomical specimens showing that the tibial attachment is more C-shaped than two discrete bundles. They actually say the bundle theory might be um, more of an illusion as the ribbon wraps around itself. And if you look closely where the posterolateral bundle is meant to be on the tibia, it's actually in the area of the anterior root attachment of the lateral meniscus. So, you know, I'm not, you know, I do think there might be a sea change in ACL anatomy. Um, certainly this is not what I was taught when I finished training, but um, you can find lots of um, things about this in the literature now. This is just a picture from a, a recent case, um, how I actually do it. You clear the notch, use a shaver, get to the back, a 45 degree all. It's quite useful because you can hook the back of the notch and then you can just come forward. You know it's five millimeters from the tip of the all to that black mark. So I can measure that to be at least five millimeters to the back. And then I put it in using the clock face and the ridges and where the anteromedial bundle I think was before. And you can see, I make sure I've got a posterior wall. So clear all the swarf um, with your shaver and make sure you've got a posterior wall. And you can actually look up your tunnel for the uh, tibial um, tunnel. This is actually anterior horn lateral meniscus. Um, it's quite red. And then you drill and pass your graft. Check there's no impingement in extension. Um, so you straighten up the graft and that's sort of a standard pictures I expect to see. How do you evaluate your tunnel placement? Should get some imaging um, following surgery, ideally before a patient leaves, or you know at least the next clinic appointment. Plain x-rays are fine. Uh, my colleague prefers to do CTs, and that is very accurate. And there is a CT protocol within our trust where you can closely uh, monitor your tunnel placement and adjust your practice. And you could use those grids as before. Um, you can't really do a talk on um, ACLs without mentioning you know, Leo Pinzeski um, and uh, you know the Sydney experience. And um, uh, I, I often refer back to this poster because it tells you where, what you should be looking for on a plain post-operative x-ray of an ACL reconstruction. Um, and, and the essential of your femoral tunnel should really be as far back as possible. So about 86% along Blumasat's line and the tibial tunnel should be no more than 50% uh, along the lateral tibial plateau. But um, I find that a quite useful way of um, assessing the prospective results, tunnel placement, but um, you do need uh, good quality x-rays, particularly the lateral. And in this, in this paper and study, they found a higher failure rate. So 17% compared to 7%, which was significant if your tibial tunnel was over 50% posterior. So the tibial tunnel uh, placement uh, in the AP plane does appear to be uh, crucial. Fixation, how are you going to fix your graft? Um, there's two main types, interference or cortical suspension. Bone teller bone grafts, they usually fix with screws. Leo Pinzeski, um, I think, developed the reverse threaded RSI screw, which is a niche thing you might get asked in an exam. Um, used for femoral fixation of the right knee to stop your graft being twisted. You want to ideally put it in front of your bone block. So um, that's just a niche thing, the reverse threaded RSI screw. Um, soft tissue grafts, you tend to use quarter suspension on the femur. You can use fixed loops or adjustable loops now. The popular ones are the Arthrex tightrope. It's also the pull-up and Smith & Nephew also have an adjustable one now. Screw on the tibia, it can be metal, stainless steel, non-absorbable. Peak, which is not absorbable, but doesn't show up on x-ray. 
uh, or an absorbable screw. Suspension on both sides is becoming more popular because you can use shorter graphs, but you've got to be careful um, uh, about the strength of your tibial bone. Some people worry about using tight suspension and buttons on uh, tibias because um, you know you can crumple and the cortex there, and certainly you can crumple the cortex with a staple. Um, the reports of tissue reaction in cysts and breakages with bioabsorbable screws. So uh, I don't use those anymore. And with the other screws in the revision scenario, you can remove them. Um, some people use a secondary fixation, uh, a staple or a screw to prevent shear. You might have um, non-absorbable whip stitches, or you will have on the tibial side, and um, you can tie those around a post. Um, on the tibia, you usually increase the screw diameter by one millimeter. Um, might be something you're asked. Femoral bone tends to be very hard. So if you're using a screw up there, you, um, you don't, it tends to be line to line. And you can use a screw in the femur for soft tissue grafts. There are other methods, which I haven't mentioned, like the transfix, where you can drill um, through the femoral lateral cortex and put two sort of pins in. Um, and there's a special uh, jig for that which is popular in the transtibial technique. Um, but uh, though I've seen that used, um, it's not something I think you all might see in very modern practice. How, where you fix the graft is a little bit controversial. You should check how high symmetric it is by looking at how far the graft moves up and down tibial tunnel um, when you go through a range of motion. Tend to fix in 20 degrees of flexion, pushing down in the tibia. If you fix too tight, it'll stretch out. You might limit flexion, but again, you don't want to fix things too loose. There were tensioning devices. Um, some people use them. They are a bit fiddly, uh, particularly if they want all four strands to be separated. Um, so I tend to just um, pull very hard or get your assistant to pull very hard. Um, I use an ender button, the femur at present. I have used um, uh, other fixation methods. The most common one is a 15 millimeter. They still stock everything from 10 millimeters to about 30, probably in your hospitals. Um, it's a fixed loop. It's got the longest track record. The disadvantage is you have to ream a slightly longer socket, your big socket or tunnel than necessary in order to flip the button. And any of you who've struggled to flip an ender button um, will know that it's important not to um, shortchange yourself. And uh, try and be careful when you're pulling those graphs through and protect your fingers. It's quite easy to for the wires to cut cut through your into and just you know cut your fingers. It's a badge of honor. So I use a Bioshaw screw made of peak. It's non-resorbable, it's MRI compatible. If I need to scan people again, particularly if I've done a meniscal repair, occasionally meniscal repairs might be symptomatic. They may fail. You may want an MRI. I usually use about a 35 millimeter screw. Tunnel tends to be 40 to 45 and I don't want to go into the joint, but I want to get as much sort of boundary fixation on the tibia as I can. I whip with fiber wire, others use Ethibond, you could use Vicryl, but um, I want to protect the graft, particularly from the screw. I'll just check time, so it was 8.07 already. Um, no. So interference screws. Can please continue, it's very yep. good. Everybody's okay, I'll continue. Um, interference screws, you've got to be aware of screw divergence. So where you put your guide wire is really important. So I take a little guide wire and I put it into the tibial tunnel and I like to see it coming out in front of the graft ideally. Um, if it's in the middle of the graft, then you could damage your screw going, your graft going in. It could take a little bit of work to make sure you, you know where that guide wire is. The length is controversial. Some want as long as possible to get aperture fixation, but you don't, especially when you're using metal screws, you, know, you don't want it to protrude into the joint. So I think 35 millimeters is fine. I don't use screw and sheath types. They're a bit fiddly. Um, you may see it. Um, we've mentioned the reverse thread. You repair meniscal lesions when you see them in um, ACL reconstructions. Actually, you know, we're getting a lot of people coming through very late, especially with COVID. And you, know, you still have to assess um, normal meniscal lesions um, to see whether they are repairable, but that's a different, different talk. I just wanted to mention the ramp lesion, which doesn't actually stand for anything. It just stands, I think, like a ramp, but it's a posterior horn meniscus capita tear, which I have seen. Um, you can hook it. It probably heals by itself in the majority of cases because it's a good healing environment once you've done an ACL. 
But um, Bernard, Bertrand Sonnery Cote, another big name, French name in ACLs, he's popularizing postural medial portals and a little spiral hook to repair properly. You can try and repair them from the front. I've done that, but um, it's worth trying to get postural medial portal in, perhaps in a cadaver first. The lateral tenodesis, that's come back into uh, vogue. Um, the antilateral ligament been around for a long time. In fact, the early ACL reconstructions were actually articular, but since 2013 in this class study, um, it's got a resurgence in interest. Um, and it might explain your second fracture, something that might come up in the exam. Maybe you know, that lateral capsular avulsion is the antilateral ligament. And in revisions and hyperextenders, marked laxity, very high performance people, you might want to do it at the same time um, as your ACL reconstruction. You can just take a strip of IT band. Um, there's a Macintosh and Lemaire method. They're quite similar, just different insertion points. Um, I tend to go just um, uh, posterior uh, and proximal to the um, lateral femoral condyle, uh, epicondyle. So you take a strip of IT band, feed it on the LCL, back to your tibia. tibia. You can fix it with anchors at that point, just posterior to the lateral epicondyle or a staple. You can get convergence with the ACL tunnel, so you normally go more anterior and proximal with that tunnel. Um, Alan Getgood AR, they've got some big studies coming out now. They've shown decreased failure rate if you use it with primaries, which stands to reason it's a greater fixation. You could over constrain the lateral compartment, so don't pull too hard. You're not meant to pull much on it. Um, and uh, some say the IT band is a main restraint to internal rotation of tibia. So you're going to reduce your pivot shift. So you've got hyperextender, that explosive pivot shift, you might want to do a, a lateral tendesis. There are other methods you can use um, um, hamstrings as well. There's an elegant method of using a semitendinosis for the uh, ACL and the gracilis for your um, uh, ALL. Um, but uh, it's fairly straightforward, apart from the capsule can be quite thin underneath the LCL and you've got to cut the IT band over the LCL. So mark it carefully, make sure you've got a good length, about 12 centimeters you need, you're going to flip it over and then carefully dissect under the ACL, LCL, sorry, um, to pass your graft. Uh, it'd be good to look at the BAS, BAS guidelines now if you're going for the exam, as it's good to look at all the BOA and BAS guidelines. They've got a consensus statement on ACL injuries. There's some controversial areas, such as DVT prophylaxis. Now, I follow my trust protocol. If it's an operation lower limb over uh, uh, 60 minutes of combined anesthetic surgical time, you should consider chemical prophylaxis. So I give a week of Clexane. They say there's no need, there's no um, risk factors. Interestingly, they say you can perform meniscal repair if you've got an acutely locked knee and it's not ready for an ACL because you haven't got either the expertise or the knee's not quiet, but ideally you perform it at the same time. I recommend you have a look at that. Timing of surgery, generally you wait until the knee's quiet. There's a risk of arthrofibrosis if you start too early, but elite athletes might be ready quicker. They've got game ready, they've got ice baths, they're very motivated. Everybody gets prehabilitation these days. Um, and it's safe to operate as soon as the knee has full active extension and is bending freely to over 90 with minimal swelling. So if you've got somebody motivated, you could operate within three weeks. It doesn't happen usually on the NHS, particularly during this COVID time. Rehab, now you may well know about open and closed chain. And traditionally there were two phases to ACL rehab, first graft protection, first six weeks, then graft strengthening. Now, it's controversial as to when your grafts are the weakest. Um, your grafts being neovascularized, they might be the weakest of six weeks. So I often think we should slow down around then. But there's lots of protocols now where they're combining open and closed chain. And there are biomechanical studies showing you can have increased forces on the knee with closed chain. So just like, say, Achilles tendon injuries, you've got accelerated rehab. And what remains the same is an initial focus, reducing your fusion, regaining range of motion, six weeks, you want to see full extension because it's hard to get that back. Then you work on flexion. I'll allow jogging at three months. Return to contact sports is nine months to a year, particularly football. The tibial slope is beyond the scope of this talk. There's a greater failure rate with higher tibial slope. 
So in revision cases, you might want to do a slope changing osteotomy. And osteotomy, again, an old technique coming back into uh, vogue and um, you know something you may see a lot of. So we're coming towards the end now. There are some unanswered questions. Which patients do well with your non-op management? You can certainly try non-op in sedentary patients, and that makes sense, unless they've got symptomatic instability. And those over 40 willing to try the approach. Um, I know people have done very well non-op. The risk of OA in the ACL deficient knee has not been proven, yet you would say an unstable joint is more at risk of arthritis, but it's not been proven. And osteoarthritis itself is contraindicated in ACL reconstruction. So I think it's still a controversial area. Some say the initial bone bruising from the pivot shift injury damages the cartilage. Um, and you know, we need more work in that, in that area. So in summary, large variation in practice globally, uh, and even nationally, I suppose. You want a good quality graft, whatever one you choose, secure initial fixation, your tunnels should allow full range of motion without impingement, avoid excessive graft tension, delay your return to contact sports for nine to 12 months, pick a winner, patients must go through tailored rehab program, it's just as important as the operation. Paper just came out recently out of Nottingham and um, they put it on the internet um, uh, freely available before press, um, a systematic review of all standard techniques and the end result was all sound techniques are comparable. So it doesn't matter what you do as long as done well. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was very um, informative, comprehensive and uh, broken down into small pieces that everyone, well, I hope everyone who is listening was able to understand. Um, I have got some questions from the audience. Um, if it's okay. So the first one is, do you cycle the knee um, movement uh, prior to the tibial fixation? And if you do, why? Yeah, yes, you must, you must cycle the knee. Um, and yeah, sorry, I didn't mention that. I don't think that's um, controversial um, because you put your graft in, you've got good femoral fixation. So you flipped your end of button. Great, you're on the home run. You need to now work out how isometric um, your tunnel is, tells you how well you've drawn, you drilled your um, tunnels. Um, so firstly, I will bend it up and down and just see how far my graft withdraws into the uh, tunnel, uh, particularly on flexion, because it's going to be tighter in flexion, okay? And then you want to get rid of more creep. So it's all about getting rid of more creep. Um, there's a viscoelastic um, um, material. I actually threw a question of those question at that one of the MCQs I did because um, it's the basic science you might want to do, and that would be a great question the FRCS because then you could talk about getting rid of creep and you want to avoid early stretch out. Now, if you don't do it and you fix it or as well, that patient may well you know stretch out just a few millimeters in the in the early um, days, give you a looser graft. We can talk about the basic science of crimp and collagen fibrils. Um, you guys are probably very hot on that. <laughs> okay. So uh, what are the tunnel dimensions uh, when you decide between the single or, sec or two stage ACL revision surgery? Do you, do, is there a difference? Yeah, I mean, I just saw a patient um, with that today. Um, and I was actually just thinking that myself. Um, the, so, and I put a question of that in the MCQs. So perhaps if we're going to do that, we can talk about it. I think it's, it's based on experience as well and um, where you think you can get a tunnel in. If you don't think you can get a new tunnel um, in a good position, um, you know, near that widened tunnel, it's always safest. It's like a two-stage revision for an infected prosthesis. Your exam answer would be, you know, it's quite a lot of tunnel widening. It's probably safe to do a uh, two-stage. Um, exact measurements are quite hard to find. If you could measure, if you had some way of measuring on your, um, on your imaging, and we can talk about which imaging you do, then that would be great, because that, that would tell you exactly. You might be lucky, and you could use that initial tunnel for your secondary revision, um, if you're lucky. Um, there is some talk about 
putting in bone dowels and drilling through um, quickly. But, you know, that's a bit risky, but um, there is talk about it. So I think, you know, really, you know when it's too, it's very small, you know when you can get past it, it's completely the wrong position, you can stay out of the way. And if it's exactly where you are, best to be safe is probably the exam answer, um, you know. Yes. So you didn't mention anything about the primary repair of the ACL. Yeah. Yeah, that is controversial, but, um, and actually that the bare technique, the BA the one that they do, they, they came up in the States with pediatricians. That's something I haven't seen anything of that so much in the UK where they put a little sponge in between the uh, two ligaments and they allow the ligaments, the ligament ends to grow into that sponge. I think the sponge just bears good for pediatrics, but you know, um, Gordon Mackay up in uh, Scotland, um, an ex a knee surgeon and ex-professional footballer has popularized the Arthrex, um, you know, tightrope technique. Um, and I, I have a friend who's using that technique in Pakistan as well. So there are, it's just like repairing any tendon, like a, um, like more like a rotator cuff, I would say. People are using suture anchors. So they are using a scorpion. You can simply take the anterior stump. So what would my exam answer be? You need to have the appropriate type of tear. So you want to tear from the femoral attachment. So you want quite a large, don't really want a mid substance repair. You want one that's come off the femoral attachment, quite healthy, younger patient. You've got to quite quickly and willing to go through that. There's not really long-term data at present. And then you can simply uh, use a, say a knee scorpion and put strong high strength fiber wire through that stump put it through suture anchors and tap the suture anchors into the femoral insertion. And um, I've seen that um, further stabilize with the tightrope, but um, there are people who say it's a devil's work. So, so I'd be careful about that. I, I wouldn't bring that up in the exam as a, yeah. so you, you, uh, you would get yourself into a lot of this uh, trouble because not necessarily being examined by a knee surgeon uh, who might know about these things. I agree. Um, okay, I've got some basic science questions as well. Uh, so I've got one about the protocol for weight bearing post-op. Yeah, I mean, I don't brace my ACLs anymore. I only brace an ACL uh, and restrict weight bearing if I've done a meniscal repair, um, and you can always restrict root repairs. Um, but um, um, I normally full weight bear because you want secure initial fixation. So I'd encourage you to do your EUA before surgery, document, it's part of the BAS consensus, document your pivot shift, your anterior jaw, your lacrimans, uh, and the others and then do it after your fixation. Yeah, when you start off, you might do a gentle lachmans. You don't want to damage all the work you've done. But as you get more confident, you might try and pivot them again. And you can say, look, there's no pivot. You're restricting your weight bearing uh, is not going to stop um, a fixation of a poorly placed ACL. So really get the effusion down, go for full range of motion. They're going to restrict their weight bearing naturally for a couple of weeks. By six weeks, Patients might still be on one stick. They're, it's not like a hip replacement when they walk in at six weeks always. They're still getting through it usually. Scars are normally well healed. Depends if you've done other work. But uh, full weight bearing, no brace routine for me. And um, I'd, mm. I'd recommend that. Excellent. Another uh, basic science, which is uh, about graft maturation. Um, what is... What is the latest evidence about the time frame for that to occur? Yeah, that's a really good point. I just say one more point because you said basic science. I don't really say about basic science. You can look up the loads that happen in normal walking going upstairs. They're like in the hundreds of Newtons, I believe, like walking or going upstairs. So you probably should know that for the exam and you could give a more basic science answer to the rehab. You know, there are, there are Newtons um, magnitudes for walking upstairs and walking along. So maturation, I think it's uh, controversial, depending on what you do, um, because that graph has to neovascularize and it breaks down. And it's quite scary if you have to go back into an ACL at six weeks, 
and it doesn't sometimes look like it did when you did it. It might, you know, there are some wispy bits, um, but you've got the collagen uh, framework, and some say it's about six weeks, I believe, that, um, no, that it's weakest. The maturation, it's like it can go on for a long time. So, you know, you're forming ligamentization. So that's why return to sport is a year, really, for contact sports, because there, there are histological studies and you want to see those tide marks and those basic signs about how ligaments join to bone. And um, you've got the complications I didn't really mention of tunnel widening, synovial mm. windscreen wiper effect of the um, synovial fluid being pushed up and down. So while you don't want to drill, you know, short, uh, a smaller diameter tunnels, you really should try and get a tight fit on both sides. They've got the graft compression tubes from Arthrex to stop expansion with the fluid you put on, and that will that will improve your maturation. So I suppose the answer would depend on how well the tunnel fit is, um, uh, you know, the quality of the graft. Um, but yeah, I'd say up, up to a year. But um, yeah, I haven't looked at that specific point recently. <laughs> okay. So uh, for acute injuries, uh, especially with multi-ligament injuries, ACL, PCL, uh, PLC, what would you, what would your preferred order be if you have multi-ligament injury? Yeah, I mean, I mean, those, if you get the choice, of course. Yeah, I mean, there's a standard, there's a standard framework for that, and I'd, I'd urge you, I'd urge you, you know, guys, you know, to look at that. My, you know, it's sort of like whether you do PCL and ACL, and then do the postural corner. And you could come back. Um, it depends. If you've got a medial side. You always have to do a medial side. But um, like major trauma, those ones. Say in my practice, we do relatively high volume ACLs. And I think your question, if they if they say you are the specialist centre, you are. You know, guys, because they're not that many of them, and you can, these are getting concentrated within the basically in the major trauma centres, mainly in specialist centres. You might have had a knee dislocation at the time of injury. That's probably more important. What, what I'd want to know first, that the first answer I'd expect is, this is a serious injury. This is high energy. Um, this patient obviously has to be assessed by less protocol. That knee, which may look reduced now, may have dislocated at the time. You should know the risk of intimal tear from the popital artery. So you should check your pulses, do a neurovascular examination, CT angiogram uh, is quite common. Um, never be a wrong answer. If you know, and doing um, ABPIs, doing uh, Dopplers, make sure you haven't got that. I've seen it a few times, um, and I've seen those patients have multi ligaments, been putting braces in A and E, and actually, you know, they had an intimal tear. By the you know, when you've seen them, they've got sort of vascular symptoms. Um, so stabilize the knee. Um, it depends on your local expertise, and there are. Uh, I've I've seen I've seen variations of things. So it's difficult to give a framework about one, but I've seen you know you, know, you don't have to do all of them. You know it's quite common to do ACL and then you know the collaterals. You need to repair collaterals. Now it depends how bad your collaterals are because if you look at your guidelines for medial collateral injury and lateral collateral injury, well the medial collateral has grades, so you should know your grades of medial collateral. If it's, you know, a pull off again from the insertion sites that may heal with, with the brace. If it's mid substance, say of the superficial MCL, just like a knee replacement, that is a very important uh, ligament. You might want to repair that directly and re reinforce that with a uh, hamstring uh, and then do an ACL as well. You've got to be thinking about your graft choice. So you might use hamstrings or thing for one say the acl you might use a large ligament for the pcl um you know you might need to have that on the side and then for the postural corner and lcl i tend to would think of the larson sort of approach when you drill through the fibula head and just do a single a single um screw in the lateral epicondyle there is the laprade approach which is more complicated because everything by the prod is more complicated but um yeah, again, it's, it's not something I've dealt with for a while, but um, that's what I'd be thinking. Just exclude the serious knee dislocation. Look at the MRI, think logically, 
and restore AP and collateral stability. Um, yeah, um, I think uh, I think what you said, Mr. Manuel, uh, about uh, multi ligament centuries coming up in the exam, it's not not about your order of fixation. It's going to be about recognizing this as a high energy injury. And yeah, I think so. To do. Um, I'd suggest that uh, if you got to the point of what, how you're going to go about fixing it, you're doing really well uh, in your question, as opposed to uh, the basic part of your uh, pass fail type question. Um, and I wouldn't push to go to discussing the order of fixation in the exam, um, because uh, it's it's never going to go that way at the first two parts, the first three minutes or so. It's all about uh, managing the patient in, in terms of uh, ATLS and uh, recognizing that there could be neurovascular injury associated with this. Um, if there's, I think we should leave the questions for now and go on to the MCQ portion of this uh, presentation. Um, if uh, Hannah, if you don't mind putting them up, thank you. Um, so everyone, if you could answer the questions really quickly, this is our way of gauging, uh, first of all, uh, how our presentation is going, but also it, it gives you an idea of the type of questions that can be asked as an MCQ in the exam. Um, while you're answering the question, I'll remind everyone that OIR UK is a, a charity uh, that uh, focuses on orthopedic uh, research. Um, but also education, please visit their website if, uh, for further courses and uh, webinars. FRCS Mentor Group is, a non -for, uh, is a, again, a charity organization. We don't uh, get money for what we're doing, but we do uh, raise money by doing a couple of things. First, the courses that we do, uh, Viva courses, um, the money on that goes to maintaining our ability to present these talks every Wednesday. Also, uh, we published a book, Concise Orthopedics. Uh, please do uh, at least browse it to see if it suits you, but we believe it's a very good book for um, preparing for the exam. All proceeds of that, again, go to maintaining this ability to provide uh, uh, these Wednesday sessions and maintaining the cost of the Zoom programming. The mentors give their time free, as does ORUK uh, lecturers like Mr. Panwar. We really do appreciate that. And a reminder that ORUK also publishes uh, quite a few books for the FRCS exam. Please do uh, look at them as well. Okay, so we're at 1.3 minutes. Um, we we'll give it to two minutes. Uh, Abdullah, while we're there, was there any burning questions you think were worthwhile asking? Okay, there are some slightly unrelated questions about ACL in children, which I believe would be outside the remit of this talk. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in addition, there was one about a theoretical, well, it's not theoretical, it's a practical situation, but I don't think it comes a lot, where you have a medial OA at the same time as having an ACL, um, I'm assuming it will be chronic. That's, that's to do with uh, joint arthroplasty, and it's the question. Absolutely. And again, I don't think it will come, if it comes in the exam. It does. It comes. I, I've been asked that question to tell you. The okay. Truth. Um, so it's uh, Mr. Panwar. My this question did come up, but I, I appreciate it's outside the remit of this presentation. Um, in terms of a middle-aged person or a younger uh, person with a, with an ACL injury, do you do an osteotomy or a, 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 a ACL? Okay. Injury, you know, yeah, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a classic question. They and they probably do it just from the medial the medial. Um, OA point of view, um, and they might give you a, a young labourer, 45 immediately OA, and then if you're doing really well, you might get to the ACL rupture and, you know, things like that. So, yeah, you know, your classic young labourers with various knees and medial, medial OA, you can talk about high tubular osteotomies um, because um, it's not going to wear out and they can um, load those properly because um, you can't reload an arthroplasty. Now, if you're talking about... Um, in an older patient, you might want to talk about a, a uni, unicompartmental knee replacement, and then they might throw that curveball in of your ACL being ruptured. Um, and so the options are there that you can do a uni with an ACL reconstruction. Again, it's rare as hen's teeth. You'd be doing very well towards the end, unless they showed you a picture of that. It's not something I'd mention. Um, but yeah, sort of thing, if you were in Oxford doing an exam, they might do that. The only interesting thing is, say you're doing the Oxford or a uni, they might want you to know that an ACL rupture is a contraindication to a medial 
or lateral uh, medial uni knee replacement. And they might talk about four bar linkage, you know, which is quite one of my favorite questions for the FRCS from the Oxford um, sort of textbook. With fixed bearing unis, um, actually, they say you can have a bit of ACL fraying, a bit of ACL rupturing. But that again is another topic for another day. And I'm glad, happy to talk about that at another point. Well, that would be, be brilliant yeah. to bring you back to talk about uh, unicondylar knees. Um, for those who uh, want to go look this up, this is actually on our YouTube channel um, with arthroplasty. And uh, one of the options we discussed was uh, unicondylar knees as part of our new arthroplasty. But we would love to have you back, Mr. Pomar, if you wish to give a talk on that. Oh, I really enjoyed it. Um, OK, so we'll close uh, the polling. I'm very disappointed in you guys. Only 44 of you have answered. Um, but uh, and there's that's not less than 50 percent of the people here. Um, but anyway, let's move on. Uh, Mr. Pamar, if you want to, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, um, I just put that one in because when I'm doing an ACL, all the mass goes out of my head usually at that point. Um, so planning, planning is um, really important because you're, you're maybe a bit tired at that stage. It's essentially your desired graft length plus 10 for your classic endo button. So perhaps I'm showing my age, um, endo button, split and nephew is quite commonly used. You need 10 millimeter turning space, really. I, I have argued this with the reps, six millimeters might do, but uh, technically it's 10 millimeters will get you through. So it was C, 35 millimeters. Um, so the drilling femoral tunnel is 40 millimeters. 25 millimeters is your desired graft insertion length. That's sort of an accepted amount of graft to put in the femur. I didn't talk about that as controversial, but a minimum is 15 for some people in France and um, 20 is okay. So then you know you need a 15 millimeter endo button because 25 plus 15 is 40. However, you need to pull that metal button up lengthwise, clear the whole button. So you've got to pull your hamstring graft up 10 more millimeters, then 25 to 35 millimeters, your metal button will reliably pass flip and you get that lovely toggle sensation. So, and it's in the Smith and Nephew Optech, um, which if you just look up, um, you know, ACL technique, you'll find it in there with a nice picture, graph length plus 10. So the risk factor for ACL graph failure. Um, so, um, very good. Low posterior tibial slope is not a risk factor. Um, high tibial slope would be a risk factor. Um, high tibial slope is beneficial for PCL injuries because your femur sits back more, but it's bad for ACLs. So people talk about slope reducing osteotomies. Um, and, you know, as I said, the femur and tibia was just to reinforce. It's accepted to put your femoral tunnel quite far back, as far back as you dare really, and your tibial tunnel not more than 50%. So you don't want to go less than 50, but you don't want to go more than 50%. You'll be vertical if you do that, and you might get more notch impingement, or they even talk about impingement on the PCL. The last one, well, I was clearly grasping for basic science, and you're clearly all very good at that. Um, you need to know the properties of viscoelastic materials, hysteresis, creep, Time dependent stress strain behavior. My favorite example is hammering in an uncemented femoral stem um, because that's when you're going to get your fractures. And that might be a question they'd asked. And strain hardening, I'm sure you guys will tell me uh, more than I would know, is to do with metals and when they pass their yield point. But it did sound quite viscoelastic y, so I thought somebody might fall for it. Clearly not. So, very well done. Brilliant. Okay. Thank, thank you, everybody. Um, these are uh, good questions. They, they will come up. Uh, they, I suspect some form of this type of MCQ would come up in the FRCS. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, this brilliant talk, Mr. Panwar. Um, the uh, ACL controversies. ACL is a standard bread and butter operation in orthopedics. You're expected to have seen it as part of your training, and so therefore it's expected that you would be able to answer a question on ACL. The trick in these questions is talking about the controversies around it. What are the pros and cons of different uh, ways? And as demonstrated, as long as you do an operation correctly um, uh, and do it well, the patient will have good results. 
but I can foresee a lot of those type of questions being uh, coached into the uh, into the exam very easily, um, including the discussion about whether you should give VTE prophylaxis or not. Um, I think that one is something to watch out for potentially later on. Um, is there, uh, if there's no burning questions, uh, Abdullah, uh, we'll stop recording here and move on to our uh, Viva session. Uh, once again, thank you, Mr. Panwar. Really excellent talk. Um, uh, I know I benefited from it, listening to it, and I'm very sure our people who are preparing for the exam will. Um, if you want to go over this talk again, it will be on the YouTube FRCS Mentor YouTube channel and on the R UK website as well. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Sean.